Hi guys, this is Alana. Welcome to the Praying Christian Woman podcast. Thanks for joining us today. I'm with my co-host Jamie Hampton. We're really excited to be here with you and today we're going to be discussing conviction versus condemnation, how to distinguish between the two, all that kind of stuff. So let's dive into our show today with a word of prayer. God, we just thank you for this time to come together and just to talk about condemnation and conviction and the way that you want us to respond, Father, to to the realization of sin in our lives. We just pray that you would let your word go out today and not return empty. God, we just ask that you would bless this time and, and just speak through us and put a guard over our mouths. Allow us to speak only the the things that need to be said and keep the rest to ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our verse of the day today is from Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. And it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So I thought that verse would be appropriate because, of course, it's talking about having no condemnation for those who are are in Christ Jesus. But, um, you know, we're we're not going to jump right into the conversation, but I just, I feel like the conversation about condemnation versus conviction is one that needs to be had because we, I myself have, have struggles with when I realize there's sin in my life and, you know, the need to move forward. I do sometimes wallow in like a feeling of condemnation or, or have this idea that God's mad at me or that he's pointing fingers angrily, you know, rather than kind of a, a picture of what conviction really should be. So I, I think that'll be an interesting conversation to have. But before we do that, um, we have a just for fun question just to kind of get us started. Um, so thinking about condemnation and, you know, being locked up, I was wondering, Alana, have you ever been in detention in school or sent to the principal's office or anything? You know, I was such a teacher's pet, goody, goody. Like I remember once in elementary school, you know how it was pretty common. Like you, you get, you do something bad. You write your name on your board yes. you do some- and you get check marks. Check. And I think in this class, it was like, if you get three checks and you have to write your name in like an actual book and that book gets laid open on parent teacher night or something like that. So like I was to the point where my, I never even got my name on the board. Like I didn't get warnings. I I really was like that much of a goody goody. Um, But once the teacher told me to go write my name on the board and I was so appalled because it was like, do you realize that I'm like, I'm not the kind of student who goes up to the front and writes her name on the board. Like that I just didn't do it. Like she, you know, and, and, and it was like, okay, go put your name on the board. And then she just went back to teaching. And so I just stayed right in my seat. I was probably in about fourth grade and it wasn't exactly defiance. I mean, yes, it was defiance, but it truly was in my brain. Like, oh, she must've made a mistake. (laughs) Like she didn't really mean that I'm supposed to go write my name on the board. Like that can't be what she meant. Don't you know who I am? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had something more fun than that. I did have to go to the assistant principal's office in junior high, but that was like not for a fun reason at all. Um, oh, do you know what I did do? I totally forgot about this. Um, I pulled a chair out like as a prank while my friend was about to sit down. Ooh. And she broke her tailbone. <gasps> so, like, I didn't get in trouble, trouble, but like, I, I remember, I forget who it was I had to talk to, but, you know, and it wasn't even like a stern thing. It was more of a, okay, was this a joke or were you actually trying to hurt her? Did you realize that this could have done something serious? Like, she had to, um, you know, like bring a, a donut shaped pillow to oh, sit no. on her. Like, I, I remember that. Um, and I, like I said, I wasn't in trouble because I think everybody just kind of realized, okay, this this really was a prank, maybe, you know, not the best thought out one, but there wasn't any malice or, you know, like it wasn't even technically like a school rule that had been broken. Do you know what I mean? It was just oh, yeah. they were sure, like that I wasn't um, going into it with intentional desire to harm. But that wasn't the one I was going to say. The one I was going to say was we were told in junior high 
that we needed to write an anonymous essay about sexual harassment and it was repeated like 10 times this is totally anonymous so go ahead and write and i had a friend who was you know being sexually harassed by another student and so i wrote about it and the next day was called to the vice principal who's like yeah your teacher recognized this as your handwriting i need to know who the student is and what exactly they've done and so like a good on them for taking sexual harassment seriously in school b like that totally felt like a betrayal in my mind because they they made you know like they made it so clear this is all a secret we just kind of want to get a feel for what's going on and and then it turned into yeah we know you were the one who wrote this and now we need to know all the details oh my goodness yeah i still am not sure how i feel about that to be totally honest like like i said i i definitely feel like it was serious enough that the school did need to address it you know it wasn't it wasn't just someone being obnoxious every so often it was like a daily gross disturbing thing Mm -hmm. but I'm still not a huge fan of the way they went about it with the, you know, confidentiality thing. Right. I don't know. Oh no. I, I can totally agree on both counts. You know, that it yeah. was, if mm -hmm. you're the mom of a kid that's being harassed, then sure you want them to do whatever they can. But on the other Absolutely. hand, that puts you in a very awkward position. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, so then my friend had to get called in and then she found out, like she even told me, she's like, yeah, I know you're the one who wrote about this. And thankfully oh, she wasn't goodness. upset about it, but yeah. You know how junior high is like you mm -hmm. quadruple guess everything. So anyway, what about you? I want to hear about you getting into trouble. Well, I really didn't get into that much trouble. It was more of a curiosity. I, I set you up to see if you would be, you know, worse behaved than me. worse. Yeah. No, nope. <laughs> now I did. I actually, I, I got my name on the board maybe a couple of times for things. Um, what I really remember was one time, cause I was, I don't know. I hate confrontation so much. And I always, I never knew follower. that about you. No, you never <laughs> knew that. Never, no, never would have guessed. Um, and I was a big rule follower. And so I remember one time I was absent for something and they had a test that they had done. And my teacher, Mrs. Dobosh, she was second grade, I think one of my favorite teachers. And she told me very clearly this is not a punishment it was the day i got back i had to take the test this is not a punishment but i need you to take this behind the chalkboard cuz people had to go sit behind the chalkboard as punishment that was the oh. in that class it was they would mm -hmm. move your chair you'd work independently behind the chalkboard mm -hmm. cuz it was kind of at an angle and there was like a little cubby with like paper and supplies and mm -hmm. stuff back there so she said i'm going to have you sit you know behind the chalkboard and do this because i don't you know we'll be doing the second part of the test and i want you to do that off on your own i cried i could not stop myself from crying and it was one of those like it caught me by surprise but i just felt like i was being punished and like i had been in trouble <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah and a silly um but I did, I have an, I had an incident where I probably should have had to go to the principal, but it was kind of a grace situation where uh -huh. I, the only time in my entire school career that I cheated and it was, I was, I realized that there was a homework assignment that was due that day during first period. And I went in with someone else that didn't know that we were supposed to do that. Um, and I went into the bathroom to copy the work mm -hmm. and the assistant principal walked in the bathroom and saw us sitting there and said, what are you doing? I think the bell had rung and I was trying mm -hmm. to get it done and we were just going to mm -hmm. be late going in. And she found out that we had been cheating, told the teacher and I was mortified, but that was to me the equivalent of going to the principal's office. Yeah. Yeah. But a, definitely a learning experience, you know, if not getting, you know, if, if you're okay with cheating, but you're not okay with not having your work in, maybe you need to think about your priorities and Makes your sense, yeah. <laughs> values. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Well, now that we have laid our deepest, darkest, and most shameful childhood escapades out there, I hope we haven't lost all of our listeners. So like, I can never trust a word Alana and Jamie say anymore because they were such hooligans. I'm people, so sorry to betray change. everybody's trust. Yes, we are. We are redeemed. Um, I don't even know what we're redeemed. We're redeemed childhood. No, I can't even. Th <laughs> Am I a redeemed goody goody? I don't know. 
I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I will have to confess. I, there was a stretch where I was not a goody goody and I didn't get caught, but I, I did some stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to lie and say I was perfect. But back then it was, you know, in terms of school behavior, I was pretty good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So that brings us into our discussion for today's episode which is kind of this distinction between conviction, condemnation. For sure, we're going to talk about how that ties into our prayer lives. So where do you want to begin? I think maybe to start with the definition of each one, because we talked a little before this about, I mean, the way I see it, conviction is a feeling or an impression or or something that happens to you in your spirit where you're, you're recognizing uh, you're convicted or made aware and, and, and made uncomfortable by the knowledge that something's not right. But condemnation, I mean, in, in the biblical sense, like in the verse, Romans 8, where it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, I feel like that's a state of being of your soul, you know, and that's not just a feeling or something. I think what they're talking about that is, okay, there's no condemnation. You are not condemned to be separated from God for eternity mm -hmm. because you're in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean necessarily, well, you're never going to feel bad. But the way that I want to look at condemnation, though, is more of a damaging frame of mind that uh -huh. makes you, you know, so kind of the I don't know, the other side of the coin of conviction, the negative side of conviction, which would be not just feeling disturbed. And I don't know, I, I want to read this scripture, actually, it's a little early, but I, I want to read this scripture, because I feel like this really clarifies to me what I'm talking about in case I'm not being clear. <laughs> uh huh. Um, Second Corinthians 7, 10 through 11 says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. And I picture that as being conviction, like a godly sorrow right. that leads to conviction and salvation. And then, but worldly sorrow brings death. And I think worldly sorrow might mean condemnation. Does that kind of, I don't know. That's kinda, Yeah, absolutely. The, and I mean, that's the exact verse that I would have gone to as well to okay. make that distinction. You know, that conviction is of the Lord. It Conviction truly is a gift from God. It's his way of telling us, hey, you need to change your ways, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And condemnation, yeah, there's the <clears throat> kind of the legal condemnation, which is, you know, okay, when I die, if I am under God's condemnation, I'm sent to hell as punishment for my sins. But we can also have this just heaviness, this sense of feeling condemned, um, kind of like overwhelming guilt is another way that I would put it, you know, more of that um, psychological feeling of guilt that you can't shake. Mm -hmm. I think this is so interesting in the verse you read in 2 Corinthians. So godly sorrow brings repentance, leads to salvation, and leaves no regret. I'm super curious. We don't mm -hmm. need to dive into it right now, but I would love to, after we kind of dissect conviction and condemnation, I also want to talk about regret because like I actually read, this actually came up in a podcast I was listening to for writers and kind of like getting into your character's psyche and things like that if you're a novelist. And at least according to this person I was listening to, shame is the most, I forget exactly how she put it, but basically like shame is a, it's stronger than anger. It's stronger than lust. It's stronger than, you know, out of all the negative emotions, shame is the one that gives you the most like primitive visceral reaction. Wow. <clears throat> so I think this will be really interesting to talk not only about, you know, how conviction is a gift from God and a blessing and, you know, overwhelming guilt is the exact opposite, but then like, where do regrets fall into there? Cause in my mind, that's even a third word that we would need to define, right? Like I can be convicted that I did something wrong. I can know that my in a way so that I'm not dealing with this crippling guilt, but I could still see a scenario where I would totally regret that, you know, like maybe somebody who, um, you know, made mistakes in their dating life. They know they're forgiven. They know they've moved on. They know that the conviction came from God, but they still might regret and they still might even live with the consequences of that. So yeah, I'm super curious to also kind of add 
this layer of regret as like a third piece to dissect in what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Good show. <laughs> no. <laughs> Adios. No, no, that I, I totally agree. So do you want to wait though? You want to wait to talk about that until we dig a little bit more into conviction? Yeah, let's just, let's just keep on digging into okay. like conviction. I don't know. Like I think of conviction and I don't really even have a negative connotation to it. I don't know if you do or if most people do like, but I, I truly I do don't. see conviction as a gift from the Lord. Yeah. I um, do. You know that your conscience speaking to you or sometimes conviction comes in, um, you know, someone else, like you hear a sermon, you're like, oh, that was so convicting. That was exactly what I needed to hear to get back on track. Or, you know, sometimes you have a friend who calls you out, you know, this doesn't happen super often because none of us want to step on anybody else's toes. But sometimes, you know, like, I think you and I have probably very gently called each other out on things Mm -hmm. every once in a while. Like, I, I can't think of any exact scenarios but you know i'm sure it's happened so it doesn't always have to be like directly from the holy spirit it can be you know sometimes we're convicted when reading the word was it josiah there was one of the kings who like apparently the israelites had just lost the law you know for years and then it was found and when the king had it read to him like he was you know ripping his clothes and repenting and weeping because he just had no idea so conviction can also come just from reading the word there are lots of ways that god can use you know the bible your well, pastor you any, your friends do you have any examples that you can think of a few of them popped into my head i'm sure i time. do but if you've got one that popped into your head why don't you share yours first and i'll try to be thinking of one too okay well, so a few of those different examples. So number one, the, when I think of conviction, one of the first things that comes to mind is a friend of mine. So when I came to college, um, I was a Christian and I definitely prayed. I believed in God. I had committed my life to Christ, but I had just, you know, kind of like I alluded to before. I mean, I was not living by the standards that God would have me live. I'll just put it that way. There were things in my life that were chronically off and chronically disobedient. And um, when I got to college, I lived across the hall from a friend and two of the girls that lived on my hall ended up being some of my best friends, you know, for, for many years. And still I consider them some of my dearest friends. And one of them was a very vocal Christian, like you couldn't talk to her and it wasn't obnoxious. It was just, you couldn't talk to her without knowing that she was a Christian and she was very uh, comfortable in that role. She wasn't self-conscious at all. Whereas I was terrified to share my faith. I was afraid people might be offended if I said anything or, you know, it was, took a lot of effort for me to Mm -hmm. be vocal and open about my faith with people I didn't know. Um, She would sit in the hallway, you know, playing praise songs on her guitar and stuff. It was very neat, but we became friends and she never, she, she gradually figured out some of the stuff that was going on that maybe wasn't the best. And she never said a word. She didn't call me out on it. She just, you know, hung out with me and we did things together and, um, it was like, but, but there was a voice in my head. Like I, I, it was like, she was speaking words, you know, and, and my conscience was peaked, you know, and I believe the Holy spirit was calling out the things in her life that I should probably be following along in line. And so I actually asked her to come into my, my dorm room one day and pray with me. Cause I said, you know, you haven't said anything about this, but I know that, you know, that I'm a Christian. I know that you know that I go to church and Bible study, but that I am living this different life behind the scenes, but you've never said anything about it, but God has opened my eyes to the fact that I have to let go of those things. I have to make Jesus the Lord of my life and not just my savior, you know, and, and absolution. Um, and, and she just said, well, then just tell him that, you know, and she sat there and prayed with me and prayed specifics of things that I needed to let go and kind of led me through, I would say kind of a recommitment of my life to Christ. And, but that, that conviction, it didn't come through words. It was just her being her. And I think that's That's cool. Yeah. And another way is I remember that same year, that same semester of college, I read the scripture 
for a Bible study I was attending and it said something, and I'm sure you'll recognize this, but it's, you know, I think it was in Matthew maybe, but it says, if any of you leads one of these little ones astray, meaning I guess either the little little children or people mm-hmm. young, whatever, right. if any of you leads one of these astray, it will be as if a mill, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck. And God really opened my eyes that there are people that I know in my life that know I'm a Christian that know this kind of inconsistency and might see it as that I'm condoning the things that I'm right. doing or, and that I'm leading them astray. And, and so that it was one of the first times that I was reading scripture and it like jumped out at me. And I, I actually in the Bible study, I think was the one that had to read that verse we were reading like the, the mm-hmm. chapter around in a circle. So that was another way that conviction came very clearly to me was just through reading God's word. That's cool. I remember a story from back in junior high and there was a girl that I had been kind of mean to. And I went through, so like halfway into that school year is when I recommitted my life to Christ. And like I hadn't, she and I didn't really interact. I just knew that like, you know, at the beginning of the school year, I was like, I I was new to the school district. Her mom and my mom worked together on some school projecty thing. And my, so her mom came to her and she's like, yeah, there's this new girl. Why don't you try to be nice to her? Um, and I just, I wasn't receptive to that is kind of how it went about. Um, And then later on in that year, I recommitted my life to Christ and I knew she was a Christian. And I remember a day where I I really did feel convicted that I I had not been kind to her. And she really had like reached out and really gone out of her way more than once to try to be a friend. And so I wrote her a note. This was, you know, back in the nineties, like wrote her a note and folded it up in a little triangle and passed it to her in (laughs) in English class. Um, And I forget exactly what I said, but, you know, just kind of apologized for that. And, and we ended up being best friends for years. Um, And so that was, that was one example. And then another example of conviction, this one coming from scripture was the year before my last year of college. And so I was home for the first few weeks and I had already taken my MCATs. I was pre-med. I had my med school application already filled out and I just needed to like click a few buttons to tell which schools I wanted it sent to. And then I was going to be on my way to, uh, you know, to be a med school applicant. And then I went to Russia on a mission trip that summer. And one morning I was laying in bed. I think it was a jet lag thing. Like I was up way earlier than I needed to be. So I was just laying in bed and the verse popped into my head about do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And I realized that so much of wanting to become a doctor for me was just wanting the, um, like at that point it wasn't about making money or, or that side of things. It was just about being academically the absolute best, you know, like getting into the most prestigious school because I had the absolute best grades and, and just realizing that my motivation for wanting to apply to med school really was selfish. And so that is what turned me around so that I, I never did end up submitting my application and spoiler alert, I'm not a doctor, (laughs) Um, but that was, that was a huge, you know, maybe, maybe one of the most pivotal, you know, life changes other than, you know, deciding to marry Scott. I can't think of a decision that was more drastically, you know, life altering. Yeah. No, those are all, yeah. I mean, I think, I think those are all ways that we can do that. Have you, what about condemnation? Have you ever, have you ever experienced that feeling of condemnation where it's been unhealthy from either people or perceived from God or just from yourself? So I am, you're either going to laugh at me or you're going to tell me that I'm like a terrible person and need to repent. I would not know either of those things. I have a deep, dark secret sin that I struggle with Now, before, like, I'm sure everybody's ears are perking up, like, when you hear it, it's going to sound dumb, but this must have been eight years ago, 
because my youngest, no, maybe nine years ago, right? So my youngest was a baby, still like in a stroller or front pack. We were, all five of us were going to go to a movie together. And it was the first time we had like, you know, it was like the first movie theater experience with the whole family. And for some reason, I forget exactly why, like I was going to go buy tickets for the kids and me. And then my husband was going to go buy his ticket. And then we were going to like meet up. Like, I think maybe he was getting in line to get the snacks and I was in line to get the tickets. I made a mistake and I just got four tickets thinking that he was getting his own ticket. So basically what happened was the five of us went into a theater after only purchasing four tickets. But then like 10 minutes in, my baby was crying anyway. So I left and just walked around the mall with him for the rest of the time. But to this day, I still feel bad that I took five people into the theater having only bought four tickets. Well, I will not laugh at you, but but I you want to definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> like but, to be honest, like this comes into my head like at least like once a month, I'm like, should I just send that movie theater a check? But okay. then I'm like, well, no, because we left the theater anyway. And if I wanted to, I could have like asked for a refund and probably gotten it. So. Okay. So no, I'm not going to laugh at you. You're not a horrible person. I admire the fact that you have that kind of integrity and that is good. I will absolve you from this though, because a similar thing happened to me. And oh, that feels so good to I hear. I absolve you from this because I do it all the time. No, Bless me, kidding. Jamie, for I have sinned. No, 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 but I'll tell you, I went okay. into a movie when, when my littlest was probably too young to go into the movie, but we thought we would try it. Yep. And about 10 minutes in or, you know, 15 minutes in, it just wasn't working. And I came out and just as a long shot, I went to the ticket booth and I said, my daughter really didn't last, you know, we've been, we, we've, and this was actually at the end, I think. And I, and I oh, just uh -huh. told them on my word, Hey, you know, we sat outside most of the movie. Is there any way I could get a refund and, and maybe use these tickets for something else? And they gave it to me. So Aww. they would have, I'm sure. Okay. Given can I ask refund. you one more question? So that so I they owe you money. Guilt. No, can I ask you one more question that'll leave the guilt totally behind me forever? Yes. Was this the theater at the mall? Yes, I Yay. think it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. So they definitely would have done that. Okay, <laughs> Alana is absolved. You guys heard it here. I am leaving that guilt. Like, it really is. Like, I can even laugh at myself because honestly, like, this comes up and I'm like, is God going to punish me? Like, is he going to withhold financial provision for me? Cause I've still got this. Do I need to be like Zacchaeus and like repay this up to four times? So I am so glad to hear you say this. <laughs> well, now I've got my own that just happened last weekend. Oh, okay. I grabbed a towel from our hotel. We had a hockey weekend. You didn't. I grabbed a towel from the hotel so I could leave it with our son because he was staying at a different place where he had to oh, bring uh -huh. his own towel uh -huh. and he forgot a towel. So I left it with him with the idea that I would grab the towel. And I even took the towel the day that we were leaving and put it in my front seat so I would remember to take it right. back to the hotel on the way out of town. That towel is sitting in my laundry basket right now. Oh. So I do feel kind of bad. I know what you mean, though, because it seems like a small thing, but I'm thinking to right. myself, that towel costs them money. And on right, principle, this truly doesn't belong to me. It really doesn't. So I do understand that. But anyway, but I so, truly like, I want to go in because, like, I'm sure a lot of people are just kind of amused that right. these are our deep, dark, you know, guilt ridden secrets. But on the well, other hand, like, what do you do? Like, if it's been 10 years and I'm still concerned about this movie ticket, like, practically what what do you encourage someone to do in a case like this or with you in the towel like do you make it right do you talk yourself out of it do you donate it to a christian thrift shop you know what i mean like what do you do in these cases where it seems kind of small but it still stays with you i just you know i think about the fact that you know the bible talks about meat sacrifice to idols you know if you if in your mm -hmm. heart you feel like it's wrong to do it then don't do it and it's wrong yeah. if you do it and you feel like you shouldn't I mean, I would say absolve yourself. Just, you know, if you really do need to make it right, then make it right. And, and it's no big deal, you know, or mm -hmm. come to terms with, okay, how much is this really going to do 
and, and just go to God and ask, and it might be something bigger than this, you know, and go to God and say, God, what should I do about this? Do I need to correct this in some way? Um, or is this just me being legalistic and, and needing right. to get over it? You know, is the time that it will take for me to drive down to Kenai and, you know, or the money that it will take for me to mail it back to them? Right, exactly. Is that really a good use of resources and time or, or not? And I can't answer that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'll have to see what feelings come up when I look at the towel after I pray about it. But yeah, um, for me though, like one thing that, that is kind of a bigger thing to me that I, you know, my inner critic is my condemner. Like that's really, Mm -hmm. and it usually doesn't have so much to do with what I've done as what I have failed to do in my mind. And so, yeah, like not living up to some kind of preconceived ideal. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I think that that area of conviction, which I think involves negative self-talk, it involves just a mindset of just, uh, I am blank labeling yourself and, and, and taking information and processing it as this is who I am and I'm a failure. And that is something where that's my inner, that that's really when I feel condemned the most in my life Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. from those things. Um, And I will say that you know, I, I mean, just the other night I struggled with this. And so this is kind of off topic a little bit, but I've been listening to a book um, called Mindset. And it I don't remember the author. I'm sure if you Google that, you'd find it. But it's basically the, the kids actually use a version of it in the school. Hmm. I was telling my son mm-hmm. about it and they actually incorporated into their curriculum. It's about the growth mindset versus the fixed yeah, mindset. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, but, you know, it, it I really think I've been catching myself having this mindset of, okay, I did a poor job managing our schedule and we were late to everything today. Therefore, Mm -hmm. I am chronically late. I am a failure. I am a poor life manager like these. Rather than, I think when we go back to this verse in 2 Corinthians, it says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Mm-hmm. I regret being late that day that, you know, I was beating myself up and, and making the mistakes. But if I had had a growth mindset or, you know, rather than because I did these things, I am this thing. If I mm-hmm. looked at it as these things happened, now let me move forward and do better. I just learned from that, that I don't right. like the feeling of being late. I don't like the consequences of being late. So tomorrow I'm going to plan better. And then there's no regret because you see that experience as a learning experience. And I think that goes back to other times that we feel conviction about something. I think it's the same thing. Feeling conviction is having that growth mindset of, okay, I'm, I'm feeling convicted about this thing, but you know what? This is going to make me better because I am moving forward and if we read more into that second Corinthians seven, 10 to 11, verse 11 says, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, earnestness, <laughs> what <laughs> eagerness to clear yourselves, eagerness to make it right. What indignation, what alarm. So like, these are things that I, I attribute to David, you know, the, the man after God's own heart, this indignation and, and alarm and, and longing for right which mm-hmm. draws us closer to God. And without that longing and without that alarm and that just recognition of what is wrong, it wouldn't drive us so fiercely to what is right and to, to where God wants us. And so I don't know. And what readiness to see justice done. So I don't know. I, I really think that mindset plays a role in whether our recognition of sin leads to repentance and, right. you know, Well, and I think about my life and I deal with guilt, I think a little bit differently than that. So I'll just tell you how I, because, you know, I, I don't feel like I have the exact same problem that you have with like negative spots spiraling and spiraling. And I think one of the tips that I have for not letting that happen is just recognizing where that comes from. 
<clears throat> so like just yeah. as a um, kind of as an analogy of how this is helpful i didn't realize until my second pregnancy that pregnancy hormones make me very 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 prone to clinical depression and i went through two first trimesters within our first year of marriage because we had a miscarriage and like I said, it wasn't until like the next pregnancy that I realized, okay, this actually isn't me. I thought that it was me. And since the only major change had been, I married my husband, like my default was, wow, Scott makes me depressed. Like he brings out the worst in me. But um, then by the time I got to like our second full-term pregnancy and realized, no, this is hormones. I realized like this isn't coming from me. Do you know what I mean? Like this isn't yeah. something that's intrinsic to me. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times like when I have guilt or that feeling of being overwhelmed or like I, I felt a little bit behind the eight ball getting this school year up and going for our homeschool stuff. And the reason it didn't spiral for me, it was like, yeah, I felt guilty. Like, okay, I should have been more on top of this. Um, but I think I just recognize like all moms feel guilty. Right. Every single woman <laughs> feels guilty. They would the term mom guilt if it didn't exactly. affect and everyone. So, like, I don't look at it as something coming from me. I just look at it as, okay, I'm a woman, I'm a mom, I'm going to feel like something is, like, I'm, I'm always going to feel like I'm behind in some area because, you know, mm -hmm. when you catch up with the laundry, you get behind on dishes. When you catch up on the dishes, you get behind on mm -hmm. dusting. Or, I mean, who, who truly dusts? <laughs> <laughs> that will be another <laughs> podcast episode where we will That's discuss... Right. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like, I'm just so used to now realizing that the feeling of guilt is kind of always going to be pervasive. Like, and I'm not talking about Holy Spirit conviction. I'm just talking about this feeling that I'm, I'm never going to feel like I'm giving a hundred percent of everything, a hundred percent of my effort because I can't. And so I just look at it as, yeah, this is just an external feeling that I feel because I'm a mom and I'm a working mom and I'm a woman, <laughs> you know, like. The death, I think it was you. I remember chatting with a friend and just having an aha moment. This was years ago, like, okay, the definition of being a mom is feeling guilty. <laughs> like, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's kind of how I keep it from spiraling into I'm a bad mom. I can't manage my time. I'm a terrible homeschooler. It's just, no, I'm, I've got a lot on my plate, <laughs> you know? And so it kind of ends there. But being able to recognize, you know, where those guilty feelings come from. Like, I know some Christians who will kind of, um, you know, kind of name it like, yeah, I know that's you, Satan. Now, I don't believe that Satan, you know, I don't believe Satan's omnipresent. And therefore, I don't believe that I'm critical enough to the kingdom of God that Satan himself is going to come and taunt me on a daily basis <laughs> and tell me I'm not good enough. But to be able to just say, like, name it like, no, nope, this feeling isn't from God, might mm -hmm. be from me, might be from the world, might be from a demon, who knows, but it's not from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to recognize that and just not not own it, you know, like it's just gonna, it's gonna bounce off. And I mean, that's for sure oversimplifying. Um, but, no, but that's incredibly helpful. And that, you know, just that idea of separating, you know, when you talk about, like in a marriage, they talk about, well, you know, remember, your husband's not your enemy, remember who the true enemy is, mm -hmm. it's either Satan or whatever the sinful nature. But yeah, that's helpful in dealing with yourself because I mean your inner right. critic is kind of its own entity and so if you can think okay that thought came from my inner critic that came from my mm -hmm. sinful nature or whatever you want to name it um, right it didn't come from God so you can move past it when you separate it from yourself I really like mm -hmm. that I think that could be helpful to a lot of people because that helps me just mentally cool. separate that I have another question. I don't know if we've gone into too much of this, but um, so you know, we've kind of talked about things that make us, you know, that, that we need to feel conviction, but not condemnation. The thought that comes to my mind is what if you do something that gravely affects someone else negatively? Like what if you... Yeah, no, I totally hear accident and <clears throat> I knew died. that's exactly where my mind was going. Like I used yeah, to have like a recurring fear that I would like run over somebody else's child. And like that, it really like almost on a daily basis, I would have this horrible fear. Like, how do you get over that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that kind of ties into this question of regret. Like sometimes, sometimes we feel guilty for things that aren't sin, you know, like 
being late in and of itself isn't a sin. Now, being chronically not managing your time, I could see how arguments could be made that that's not ideal. But like, you know, if, right. if, if you're stuck from... in construction and you're late, like you haven't sinned. <laughs> right. And I mean, same thing. If, if it's like some kind of just freak accident where you truly had no control, like that's not a sin, but I could so see myself going down so many rabbit holes. What if I had mm-hmm. prayed that morning that God would keep me from harm? What if I had, you know, left just a little earlier? I could see myself going down every single one of those rabbit holes. And I think sometimes you just need to, um, need to stop. So like, I know we recently talked on a previous episode about my son Silas born with some really significant brain damage. And I, I went through the what ifs. What if I had done this during the pregnancy? What if I hadn't done that? You know, like, what if it's my fault that something I did, you know, created this problem? And I realized if I persisted in that train of thought, like there was not going to be any positive outcome. Mm-mm. You know what I mean? Like what happens to Silas happened. Um, so real quick, not to get into too many details, but like my first son was born via C-section and I pushed really, really hard to not have to have a C-section with Silas. And medically, it's very plausible that if I had just agreed, yeah, let's just do another C-section, he, he may not have suffered any of the health issues that he did. You know, so it would be so easy for me to spend every single ounce of my mental energy beating myself up for that decision. Right. But it wouldn't have changed the fact that I did not have a C-section and that Silas had brain damage at birth. So I think sometimes you just have to make the conscious choice to stop going down the what if trail because what is done is done. Yes, God could have changed things. God could have changed my mind. God could have could have prevented it. I mean, I don't like laying it on God entirely. <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. I don't feel like God was culpable in like a sense that he is guilty. Um, so I, I'm not saying that, but eventually I just had to say, you know what, what happened happened. You know, same thing, like let's say you wake up and realize that you're so unhappy in your marriage and you wonder, you know, what if I hadn't married this guy? You could destroy your life going down that rabbit hole. So instead say, okay, I did marry this guy. What am I going to do now? <laughs> you know, like yeah. focus on the things that, that can be changed. Um, I'm not amazing at that. So I don't have like incredible tips, but I know sometimes you just need to not go down the what if trail because it's already happened. And so it's just a matter of making the best of it. Yes. And I think that's, that was the exact example I was thinking of. I think, cause I'm still thinking about the interview with Leslie Strobel where she mm. talked about, you know, I think she even mentioned in the interview, you know, if you like, let's say you marry someone who's not a believer and maybe at the time you were not a believer and then you become a believer and think, well, I made the wrong choice. What if I had married yeah. someone else? And she said, you are the person you're with today is the person that you're supposed to be with. There's no if there's, this is how it is. And, and that you take that day and then you move forward from there. And I think it, it would have to be the same for something even tragic or, or Mm -hmm. irreversible. Exactly. But you still have the choice of what you do next. So, I mean, let's say you can still invite God into what happens next. And, and take ownership of it, I would say. So, I mean, let's yeah. say that it's not even like a spiritual mismatch marriage, but an abusive marriage. Okay, so maybe maybe there were warning signs. You know, maybe some people tried to tell you this wasn't a good situation. You're still there, but the next step is up to you. Like, you can't change the choices that led you to where you are, but you can change. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to oversimplify really complicated issues like abuse. Absolutely not. But the fact that you made a choice 10 years ago and feel stuck with the, with the consequences of that choice. Yeah. You can't change that choice, but you can change the choice that you make, you know, five minutes from now, whether that choice is okay, I'm going to um, make the most of my situation and trust God. Or, you know, sometimes that choice might need to be, I need to remove myself from this unsafe situation, you know, Jamie and I are never going to encourage someone to stay in like a physically dangerous scenario or something like that, just because you made a choice 20 years ago. Um, you know, we're getting into potentially murky water here, but you know, I think we're both okay with just, yeah, if you need to be safe, like that's, that's on you to get get yourself to safety. Um, you know, so I think sometimes even just taking, 
taking ownership of what happens from from now on. Like I know this is um, advice that's given to like adults who experienced abuse in their childhood. Like the abuse wasn't your fault. You couldn't have stopped it. But the choices that you make from now on, yeah, you have absolute control over those. Yeah. No, and I, that can kind of help you get out of a victim mindset too, you know, because it's um, it's really hard to live your life feeling like you don't have any control of anything, you know, and feeling like you're, you know, left and right being victimized. Well, it's time to like step up and take take some control of those things that are within your control. And I think that's that's something that I've come to realize about myself too is the victim mindset that I often revert to or wallow in, it's not just a bad habit and and feeling condemnation from myself or allowing my negative self-talk to be received as truth. Mm -hmm. It's not just a bad habit. It's sin. I mean, it's it's believing when I know the truth, it's believing Mm -hmm. lies and and giving them power. And so I think that that has been a pivotal thing for me too, to realize that, you know, I... I need to own the fact that I know the truth and I need to stand on that and fight against the lies and, and yeah. other, anything other than that is really sin. Yeah. But you know, I think early on as little girls, a lot of us are conditioned to believe that like we can insult ourselves in order to get compliments, you know, like, mm-hmm. Oh, I hate how my hair looks today. And then right. your best friend says, Oh no, it looks so pretty. Yep. Like that's how, that's how little girls are taught to fish for compliments. And mm-hmm. I could totally see that carrying into our adult lives. You know, like you get used to saying bad things about yourself in order to hear, you know, that other little girl on the playground tell you it's not true. Well now you're just conditioned to say it to your brain. There's no other little girl there to tell you it's not true. <laughs> like you're not even getting the the pseudo benefits of those negative thoughts. But yeah, those things can be very deeply ingrained. Yeah. Or saying it first so that someone else won't someone say else it. won't say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one other question I thought would be kind of interesting. It's the other side of the coin is what if there's the other extreme? Someone that never feels conviction. They read the Bible and they're always feeling like God is telling them good things and they have this good girl complex. I mean, can that be just as damaging as condemnation? I think for sure. But I think we also have to be careful. Like, you know, the story about Martin Luther who would like make up or not quite make up, but like he'd come to confession with like an hour's worth of lists (laughs) of things, you know, like almost I feel like sometimes we're conditioned to have to fabricate things to confess. Right. Um, and, and no, I mean, that, that could tie into like false pride, false humility. Mm-hmm. I mean, that could, that's, that's no good either. I think really just, um, I think it's Paul who talks about like, yeah, I've got a clear conscience before you and before God. Like, that's mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> it's okay if sometimes mm-hmm. you're like, yeah, I can't really, I think, um, so as an example, I think it's been a little bit, Jamie, you and I may have fallen out of this habit, you know, but we'll often start our recording sessions with, all right, you know, what what confessions do you have? Well, you know, you and I both confessed our, um, you know, my movie theater and your, uh, your hotel towel. That's right. We did it (laughs) on the air this time. That was, we did, you know, so sometimes though, like I admit sometimes like, well, I don't, I don't really know, but at the very least, I think what, if I can't think of an actual sin, you know, I don't want to just fabricate something, but what I try to do is at least come up with like a struggle or temptation. So maybe like, yeah, I can't really think of anything major right now, but I do know that I'm struggling in this area. So sometimes Mm -hmm. even just recognizing and confessing your temptations. And I I don't think that temptations necessarily are sins, um, but even just recognizing your weaknesses can be important. So, you know, in my mind, if you truly can't think of something to confess before God, A, ask him to bring to mind your hidden sins, confess your hidden sins, even if you don't have any that come to mind, just say, you know, like, all right, God, I'm sure I've done something wrong. (laughs) Please forgive me and show me what it is. But then also just realizing if, if nothing truly does come to mind, I don't feel like you need to fabricate, but at the very least, like, it'd be good to acknowledge the areas that could become problematic for you. So like maybe you're not yelling at the kids and you don't need to confess that you're yelling at the kids, but maybe you just recognize it 
internally you're feeling a little bit short-tempered or tired. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of admit that as a weakness. You know, I, I feel like confession has two connotations. Like one is actual sins that you confess. And one is just confessing your weaknesses and temptations. Like they might not be to the point of being sins, but just acknowledging that you're relying on God to help those things not become sins, I think can be important. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I like that. Cool. Well, I know we were going to circle back onto regret, but I think we kind of covered that with, you know, that talk about bunny trails and the what ifs and things. Yeah. Yeah. So are we ready to kind of close up our episode? It was a really, really interesting discussion. Yeah, it definitely was. Yeah, definitely. I don't have anything else. Awesome. Well, if you guys don't know yet, we have a Facebook group called the Praying Christian Women Community. So this is a fun way to just stay connected throughout the week. And we would love to see you there. And let's end with our blessing and benediction. May your heart rejoice today, though you may be suffering grief and all sorts of trials. In the midst of your testing, may your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the day of Christ's return. May his hope sustain you through whatever valleys you journey through. May he turn all your darkness into light and clothe you with robes of rejoicing instead of a spirit of despair. And our benediction comes from Revelation 1, 5 to 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.